Thanks for having me. Uh, so, the title of this address is, Lord, I don't understand, because there's just an awful lot in this world that I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't want to accept it. Uh, just for instance, the, in the last 10 days, we've suffered uh, two major shootings again, one in Atlanta and one in Colorado, senseless violence, real people lost. We used to continue to suffer with the oppression of COVID and the loss of some 500,000 people. And I think of this because when there was this type of a shooting in uh, where I work in Thousand Oaks, it was the borderline shooting, and then one of those lost was a client of mine, and the other was a very fine sergeant with the Ventura Sheriff's Department, very well respected and known. And I, when I look at these now and I see them in the news, I just want to ignore it. I, I, I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to read about it, I don't want to read about the victims the, and who they were and what happened. And then it occurs to me that this is really what the enemy wants. He wants us to quit having compassion, to quit caring, to quit trying to uh, fight this evil. He wants our complacency. And yet I remember the uh, words of our Savior who tells us, love your brother, love your sister as yourself. And, you know, I know that King David felt this way because this is the psalm that we're looking at today expresses, he tells us some of his struggles and the difficulties he had with the various enemy and enemies that he had in his time. It's Psalm 143. He says, O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In our faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. And he goes on to say, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. For I have put my trust in you. I am your servant. What I really appreciate about this is that is David recognized who he was, and that was is that he was an adulterer, and he had murdered his best general. And so... When he came before God, he had to be about as humble as anybody could be, and that's how I feel, and yet I know that, and appreciate what he has to say is, do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. So we're all okay to come before our Lord and ask uh, that he hear our prayers, and the devil roams this world like a ravenous wolf. He is the one who thrives in darkness, and so it is difficult to speak of the difficult and really tragic things in our lives, but to shine the light on it is important. Uh, I have a personal situation right now where for a long time is, is in my career I've, I've sort of felt like I uh, was put on the bench. <laughs> you know, God said, yeah, you're getting old, you know, let the younger guys do it, you know, and I'm just like, you know, like when I was a kid in high school, you know, I'd sit on that bench and I'd 
you know, look down to the coach and I'd say, you know, put me in, coach. You know, it's been my prayers with God for a long time now, for three or four years, you know, put me back in, you know, give me something significant. Well, now I've got it and now I'm afraid of it. (laughs) So I have a, was a, a deacon in the Catholic Church, which is really a very honored position in the Catholic Church, uh, has come to me, and he has a son, and it was some two years ago, and his son is in prison at Pelican Bay, no less, and he's doing 10 years, and he's spent the last 10 years proving his son's innocence along with a a woman who's just this magnificent angel who's investigated all of this with him, and they've brought all this to me, and I look at it and I can't believe it, and then the more I look at it, the more I realize is that this young man who's done 10 years is innocent, and at this point in time, the uh, district attorney's office has now acknowledged that they withheld exculpatory evidence in his trial, and they're going to set aside his judgment, but they haven't decided whether they're going to put him through another trial. And so I, I look at this, and I also see that it's all about, in this neighborhood in Oxnard, it's all about retaliatory shootings, young people shooting each other for no reason. Just, it's just chaos. It's insanity. Then I get, I get discouraged. You know, when I, when I look at this, and I want to say, I don't get it, Lord, I don't understand. Why is it like this? Why must we live in a world that has this going on? And then I remember the redeeming sacrifice of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, such as when on this Palm Sunday, he made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And they all said to him, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And, but he knew, didn't he? Jesus knew that as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city, the scripture tells us that he wept over it. And he also knew that within four days, in that period of time, he would be arrested and they would crucify him. And I think of Jesus on the, in his prayer on the Mount of Olives. And right before all this happened, where he tells us that scriptures tell us that he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the love, but also this is the humanity of Jesus Christ, that in his time and in difficult circumstances of enormous anguish and fear, that we are able to relate to our Lord and Savior because he had that same fear, that same anguish, and that same prayer, if it is possible, take this cup from me. And then he ends it with, but your will be done. See, he, Jesus went to his death willingly even though he was the Son of God, uh, telling us, once again at the scripture at Luke 22, 52 through 53, then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. This is how we can feel. 
that there is these times and perhaps the time that we're in where darkness reigns. And certainly for a lot of people, their suffering is as a result of the strength of the evil one in our society and on our world. And we want to turn away from that. We don't want to believe it. And yet, through our prayers and our faith, we have the power to turn this around. And so, my message is, is don't turn away. But I also have another message from a friend of mine, real hero of mine, a man by the name of Tony Campolo. Maybe uh, a lot of you, some of you may have heard of him. He's certainly a great evangelist, and he's written a lot of books, and I got a chance to get to know him a little bit. And he's a man who'd gone everywhere and was a tremendous storyteller about the places and the times that he's been with the least of us, and he has seen the redemption of communities and individuals through the care of the, of the people that believe in Christ. And one of his stories is, is that he would go to an African-American church, and at this particular church, there was the senior pastor and the associate pastor, and it was like Palm Sunday, and the associate pastor, it was his turn, and he was very excited about it, and he got up there to give a Holy Ghost-inspired sermon, and before he got up there, he said to his senior pastor, he said, check this out. And you know, this is a great African-American church where there's all of this response to, and he's up there preaching for 30, 40 minutes, and he's stamping his foot, and the people are up, and they're clapping, and they're, they're feeling the moment, and it's a glorious thing for him, and he finally comes back and sits down next to the senior pastor, and he's you know, got that smug look as, you know, look at who I am. And the senior pastor just nods at him and comes up in front of his congregation. And he just says, It may feel like Friday, but Sunday's a common. It may be that there are dark clouds and gloomy darkness out there. And it feels like Friday, but Sunday's a coming. And it may be that your friends have deserted you. And it may be that all that have turned around to you, that it's like Friday. But I'm telling you, Sunday's a coming. And the people start to stir and stand up, and they're in the aisles. And he says, you know, it may be that it's Friday and your Lord and Savior is up there on that cross and he will soon be in that tomb and all is, all is lost. It may feel like Friday, but I'm telling you, Sunday's a coming. Sunday's a coming. And that Sunday is coming next Sunday. And that, for all of you who are believers in this church and across this world, I'm here to tell you that that Sunday is coming. May you pray with me. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for the grace that you have shown me, and I thank you for this congregation. And Lord, we ask, we pray that the evil one not be allowed to roam like a ravenous wolf, that his Christian warriors 
will come together in prayer to take away his power and that your redemption and your protection will come upon us all in this world, in this country, and in our own communities. And we say this in Christ's name, amen.